Okay. Like the small group. Which one of you guys was all about? Small and intimate. Which one of you guys how are you doing? Um, has heard a presentation called The Five Levels of Pleasure? Put your hands up. Really? Wow. Okay. So I assume that most of you had. So I'm going to recap of a little bit of it, but then I'm going to add a lot more to it. Okay? Are we supposed to watch? What? Are we supposed to watch something? Uh, no, I just thought since you've been involved in other programs here before, oh, okay. you'd actually heard that presentation before. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, and then we're going to talk about some more deeper stuff. If you heard this before, you've heard a lot of new information, but I'll recap because it's going to be very important for the second part of the, uh, of the program. I want to start by telling you about a letter I received this week. I'm a little emotional about it. It came by email, and it was addressed to me, Rabbi Lawrence Adjo. And if I get emotional, you'll excuse me. Um, the email came to me and said, uh, Rabbi Lawrence Adjo, you have won. Five million dollars. <laughs> what? <laughs> Do you know me other than you? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was Mr. Tonga from Africa. And um, he told me that I'd actually had a great, great uncle who'd served in the war. Uh, I didn't know I had uncles in Africa, actually. And he told me that um, I was going to inherit five million dollars. I was the next in line, which is unusual because they weren't Jewish and I am. And I responded. And um, he said that, you know, the money was mine. All I had to do was send a $500 processing fee, oh. right? Uh, cash, ideally. But if not, they're willing to take a credit card. And uh, that was it. Seems like a small price to pay. What? what? Yeah, no, 500 bucks processing fee. You're talking to a millionaire. What's the problem? You don't, you don't look happy for me. What's wrong with you all? We don't trust the source. Of course you don't trust the source. It's ridiculous, and people, by the way, are still willing to give up hundreds of dollars of their own money, hoping maybe that Mr. Tonga is going to give them. There's actually a great TED video, uh, you can see it afterwards, of a guy who actually got into a conversation with uh, one of these people to see how far he could actually take him before he realized that uh, it was a scam. Um, we know instinctively... We know... Sorry. We know instinctively that it can't be true. Why? Because whenever we receive a gift in life, whatever it is, it comes with a price. Everything we have, everything we do, comes with a price. Nothing is for free, right? No such thing as a uh, free lunch, is that expression? So what we're going to do today is we're going to go through some ideas that are connected to this idea of how everything we experience in life has to come with a cost. Um, let me ask you, what's the best way to fly? What would you say? First class. First class! Right. Your own jet. Your own jet. Oh, even better. Even better. <laughs> so, leave your own jet. If you have your own jet, we need to talk afterwards about donating to a, uh, a little uh, makeup over here. But, um, first class. Anyone here flown first, first, first class before? Can I say a little story about Hold on, hold on. Let me finish off. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Second hour is for you guys. First hour is for me. <laughs> Everyone. Like I love the Jewish people. Huh? <laughs> Everyone has been first class. You experienced first class. First class is fantastic. You know, I've never flown first class. I was actually bumped up to business class, but never first class. They say when you fly first class, by the way, it's a whole different experience. You get only six, seven people in the cabin. Everyone's comfortable. You get like a bed. If you fly El Al, when they hit you, they use an open hand rather than a fist. It's a much, uh, a much more, uh, you know, agreeable experience. What comes after first class? Come. No, business, business class, actually oh, second class, sorry. but they can't call it second class, can they? Because second class flyer, not so good, right? Some airlines don't have three, they only have two. Okay, but let's go with in general categories, business class, ambassador travel, executive travel. They'll find different names for it, right? But it's second class. What comes after that? Coach. Coach, economy, it's actually third class, but they can't call it third class. That's disgusting, right? Who wants to fly third class, right? Well, that's they make it economy. Oh, I'm saving money. Which is not I like to save money, right? Especially the Persian Jews and the Russian Jews. I'm saving money. Oh, put me in coach. Now, by the way, you'll notice there's a curtain between business class and coach. Now, I thought that was actually to keep people out. It's actually to keep the smell out of coach from going into business class. That's really what it's for, you know? Because it's also, you walk in there, and you're, oh, all the people squished together, the smells, the, the terrible aromas, all this stuff is horrendous. So that's what it's for. What comes after that, by the way? Luggage. <laughs> Luggage, absolutely. Where they put your bags, suitcases, the cats, the dogs, the goats, right? And what comes after that? 
exhaust pipes? After that, right, after that, they give you a rope for us, they wrap around your waist, they wrap around the tail, and they say, hang on. We are all flying through this journey called life. We're all going through it, no matter how rich, how poor is irrelevant. In the end, let's fly first class. Let's get the most out of what we are. We want to become first class travelers, okay? Now, what is it that all of us have in common? All humans have this in common. There's one thing which we all have, hopefully, and that is a desire for happiness and a desire for pleasure. That's really what we're after, yeah. Does that mean we're flying first class in Poland? We're flying, very nice try. If you want to pay the extra, you can fly first class in Poland, I'll tell you. Although, I actually flew a lot to Poland once, and they should rename that airline to Little. Because <laughs> I didn't know a lot. So. Um, but by the way, Lufthansa, now that's an airline. The that is the Germans. Turkish. They know how to do good Turkish. stuff, I tell you. They know how to do oh, they, 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 they run a fantastic airline. Anyway, so we humans all want one thing. Right? We want pleasure. Right? We want to be have pleasure experiences, don't we? We all want experience that. We all want to enjoy life, get the most out of it. And that's really what we're after. I have a question for you. And this is a question maybe many of you have never thought of before. What makes a pleasure pleasurable? Right? We all like, um, you like good music? Mark, you like good music? Dota, Dota right? Ota. Dota. You like good food? Ota. Ota. You like good food? You do, right? You look like you do, right? You're working out, you're burning a lot of fuel, right? Like a nice steak? You're not vegetarian, are you? You don't look vegetarian to me. You look like a meat eater, yeah? You like good music? What's your name again? Anna. Anna's going to take me a few weeks to get it. Anna, you like good music? What kind of music do you like? <coughs> Everything. Everything. Hard rock, classic, you name it. Everything except for rap. Everything except for rap. Yeah, I'm with you there as well, right? You don't look like a rap star to me. You look too cultured and too... Right. What makes the food enjoyable? What makes the music good? What makes anything that we enjoy, that we spend so much time and effort in acquiring, what makes it so enjoyable? No, seriously, that's, that's a good question, right? We're all searching for this, this elixir of, of life, of enjoyment, of pleasure. What makes any pleasure pleasurable? Listen to that music, it feels good. You like art? What's your name, sir? Iran. Iran, yes. Israeli? Originally. Originally. <laughs> If you're originally you are, then you always are. Yeah. <laughs> you can run, you can't hide with a name like that. No, okay, so you enjoy pleasurable things, right? Like music, you like art, you ever see a nice piece of art, you look at it and you're like, whoa, that's a nice piece of art, right? I studied with a guy, went to his house, he has a $16 million painting on his wall. It's an orange blob, right? But people get enjoyment out of these things, you know? And I look at it and I, I also see a beauty in these things, which, you know, you start to appreciate after a while. Red wine, any, any wine drinkers here? I know we're at Rage, you're all vodka drinkers. White wine, white wine, red wine drinkers here? Whiskey. Vodka? Whiskey. Whiskey. A bourbon, yeah, a good bourbon, a good whiskey. What makes it so good on your tongue? What makes it you're willing to spend 60, 70, 80, 90 dollars on a bottle of wine, 100, 200, a crazy amount of money on this alcohol for just that? What is it that's doing? What's making the music good? What's making the art so good in the eye? What is that missing link? What's making it? I, this, by the way, this idea is unbelievable. It's going to change your life. What I'm going to share with you is going to change your life. It really is. I never thought about it. It's enjoyable, but I never thought about it. But yeah, but what is it? What makes it? We're looking for the single pleasure. We spend our time and money. People working jobs they don't like for months and months to get two weeks of enjoyment or some vacation. What are they working for? What is that thing? So I'll give you the answer to this question. It's a beautiful answer. The answer, listen very carefully. The answer is harmony. It harmonizes. Hi, ah, welcome. Hello, hey guys. I guess I'll find this. Yeah, seat. take a seat over here if you want. Yeah, relax. Okay, Russian time is good. Chorus! <laughs> this is enjoyment. This is family coming together again. This is nice. Oh, yeah, this is nice. This should be. I thought there was material. I thought it was like really no. material. This is good. So you guys are moving it. So yeah. 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 It's recording. So you think it's an earthquake? That's, no, no, that's, that's bad. It's good. It's good. It's good. <laughs> harmony. What does that mean, harmony? What does that mean? Well, think about it. What makes the music so good? It's the right amount of drum, 
to the right amount of guitar, the right amount of bass, the right amount of vocals. Now Mark hears music, he hears it different from Anna. He has a different appreciation, right? Because whatever harmonizes in your ears the best, when it bounces into your eardrum, that's what gives you pleasure. It's going to be different for everyone. What makes the art so beautiful? The right amount of red, the right amount of green, the right amount of red, yellow, the right amount of red, whatever it is, all combines together. Some people like beautiful art, or building, whatever it is, a seaside, it makes no difference how it harmonizes in your mind. Hello. She has started with three thirds, yeah. Come, 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 take a seat over here. Feel comfortable. What makes the food so good? How about pizza? So I everyone likes pizza, yeah? What makes pizza so good? The right amount of dough to the right amount of sauce. The sauce has to, have, has to have the right amount of ingredients. Too much salt, ugh, I can't eat it. Too little salt, I can't taste it. When all the ingredients harmonize together, they become enjoyable. Music, relationships, what makes a relationship good? What makes a marriage good? What makes a boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it is? You're in harmony with each other. You want the same things. You fit together, it works together. So actually, we are not pleasure seekers. We humans, this is all humans, are actually harmony seekers. Right? What makes that beautiful sunset? Everything comes together, the right colors, the right emotions, the right feelings, it all comes together. That's what we are. We want it from our love relationships, we want it from our friendships, we want it from the art we look at, the food we eat, we want everything to combine and harmonize. That is the human condition. And that's gonna be our discussion. So we're going to go through them, and some of you may have heard this, some of the ideas before, but I'm going to add a few new elements which will really change things. Let's start at the bottom. Let's work out what really motivates us. What is the basic desire that most people have? What do most of us desire? To be happy. To be happy, that's true. But we're going to have to, we're going to unpeel that, right? We're going to unpeel it and get a little bit deeper, by the way. By the way, this isn't my idea. There was a great rabbi called Rav Moshe Chaim Lutzato. He was an Italian rabbi, a Kabbalist, lived a few hundred years ago, and he wrote some very interesting, deep Kabbalistic books, but also these books are accepted. The Ramchal, as they were known. Um, he wrote some books which really kind of opened up our eyes to different ways of thinking about life. And in his introduction to one of his books, I believe it's the Derech Hashem, The Way of God, he says that we humans in the end are just looking for happiness. That's really the human condition. And he says that all of Judaism, really, if you come down to it, is there to give us enjoyment. You have to enjoy it. Which for a lot of people who went through Hebrew day school, they can't believe that. It's all about torture and pain. But that's not what he says. He says real Judaism is all about enjoying this world, enjoying everything about this world, enjoying pleasures from this world. What is the basic desire that most people have? Say it. What are most people? Eating, thank you. Sleeping, you know, when you have kids, right, more than any other pleasure, sleeping takes you away from eating, you realize that, right? Sleeping becomes the most enjoyable pleasure you have. <coughs> what else? Say it, shout it out, don't be shy. Working. Working? <laughs> wow, you must enjoy your job. You're a PA, right? Yeah. You do, we're going to see why. You're going to discover today why you do, actually. I'm going to reveal to you something unbelievable. That's going to reveal to you. Thinking. Okay? Thinking is interesting. This is more of a physical thing we're looking at over here. Shelter. Right? Shelter. Housing. Yeah? We like to be housed. Warm. Yeah? Warmth. We'll put on the housing. Physical intimacy. Right? All these things. Relationships. All these things are things that we seek. We all need. We need to eat. We need to drink. We need to sleep. We need to house ourselves. These are basic desires. How does Judaism, by the way, Consider these ideas of physical pleasure. How do they view it? How do they Judaism views good, bad, neutral? Good. 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 Other religions say, oh, they're sinful, but you've got to do them. Well, I know these are good things. Right? It's interesting. A lot of other religions and gurus, the, the top level is the single person, right, devoid of any physicality, separate from the physical world, sitting in an orange sheet, right, with sandals, meditating on a mountain top. Oh, I reached the level of... <coughs> the Jewish view is the exact opposite of that. The Jewish view... Officer, I deny everything. <laughs> Come, take a seat. The Jewish view is no! The exact opposite. You take the physical and you lift it up. All these things are good. The question is, all physical pleasures are good. Who, when, 
where, why, and how. Once you answer all those questions, you can enjoy everything. But you've got to put thought into it. You've got to understand it. You can't just do it. It takes time and effort to appreciate what that thing is. I'll give you an interesting story on this. Um, talking about drinking, I, I like a nice red wine. I'll just throw that out there because you guys will be spending Shabbat in my home. I just throw it out there. You've already been. I like a red wine. I didn't used to, but I got used to it. I used to go when I was a single guy in yeshiva. I was doing my rabbinical degree. I started smicha. I started drinking wine on Shabbat. And I started to get better and enjoy it and appreciate it. So, so much so that when I lead, led, I became a rabbi, I started leading trips to Israel. So I've led maybe 25 trips. Ota was on a trip with me to Israel. Did he do a winery ever? You want to show me? We did a winery, yeah? So the winery is a good time. A little too good. So I actually stopped it. Because the rest of the day was lost after that. For me, never mind everyone else. <laughs> so we, we went to a winery, and then every winery they show you in Israel, you know Israel has award-winning wines. So there was a lady on this winery, and she tried to explain to us how wine works, what makes wine good, right? So she pulled me up front, and said, okay, Rabbi, before you make the blessing over the wine, I'm going to explain to you how to drink wine. I mean, how to drink wine? How do I drink wine? You just knock it back. Hello? You're talking about, all right, just go, wine comes, I go, whoop. So I was about to drink it. She's like, no, stop, Rabbi. She's Israeli, here's my Israeli accent. Stop, Rabbi. First of all, you have to smell it. So I got the wine. All right, I'm like, smells like wine. And it's like, now you have to move it around the glass. All right, why do you do that? Do you know they tilt it? Have you seen them tilt it? Hold on, this. What they do is, they, it's meant to leave long, what they call long legs in the industry, right? Long lines. The longer the lines, the better acidity. But I'll come out, I remember, it's a good sign. I'm tilting it. I'm like, looks like wine. You have to move it around the glass. I'm moving it. You've got to aerate it. I'm like, it's in the air. Should I breathe on it? What should I do? And then she's like, you've got to put it in your mouth. And she's like, no, don't swallow. Move it around your mouth. So I'm like, now take air into your mouth. I'm like, <laughs> and then she's like, okay, now spit it out. Like, and I drank it. What's she telling me? A very important secret. You see, when you drink wine, I drink wine. We enjoy the wine. Wine is good to drink. But when she enjoys wine, she enjoys it so much more. She gets so much more out of it. She gets hints of blueberry, of wood, of chocolate. I was like, there's chocolate in the wine. She's like, no, but you can taste it. Really? If you understand it, if you appreciate it, if you become knowledgeable of it, you can appreciate it much, much more. It's a great lesson in how we understand the idea of physical pleasures. Whatever the physical pleasure is, from drinking, sleeping, intimacy, whatever it is, don't just do it. Think, put ideas into it, put knowledge into it. Okay? Now, there's a bit of a problem over here. All physical pleasures really come with a catch. They come with a catch. What's that? The catch is there's always a counterfeit that comes with every pleasure that we enjoy. What does a counterfeit mean? It looks real, it smells real, it tastes real, but it's not real. It's not emet, as we say in Hebrew. It's not real. Why would that be? Why would God create the world? I'll prove it to you very clearly in a second, and this is going to be true for every level we're going to discuss. What does this mean? That means that God had to create free will. In order to have free will, there's got to be 50-50, good to bad. Always. This is a diagram my Rebbe used to always so for us, do you remember in science, you yeah, had the XY axes? Oh, time medical school, XY axes, you do science, and there's the parabola like that. <coughs> right? This is the secret to life. Here's the positive, here's the negative. Remember that? Anything over here, but this is very true, this whole diagram, what's Berkeley? Anything over here must have an opposite over here. Right? So this is plus 10, this is minus 10. This is 50, right? But be careful, because you get to minus 50 over here. And then you get to 90. But the potential for good must, by definition, in order to have free will, must be over here, the minus 90. That's why you see great people do crazy things sometimes. I'm not excusing it. But great giants, whatever, can do things and they fall much further. A doctor. A doctor is graded different to a garbage guy. A doctor is graded by every millimeter. They're doing surgery, right? They're administering medicine. It's more than a lack. And they're graded according to that. 
The garbage guy, he's not measured by inches, he's measured by streets. He missed a couple of streets, who cares? You know? If the higher you go over here, the bigger you fall. The greater potential for good, the greater potential for bad. The greater potential for creating life, creating children, the potential for destruction of non-creating and breaking things down. Right? Physical intimacy can create life, or it can ruin families, ruin marriages, ruin everything. Ruin everything that we are. It must be that way in order to have 50-50. Okay? It's got to be 50-50. So any positive application of anything in life, the greater it is, the bigger the responsibility, and the more you can fall. There's a lot more to this, and this idea we're going to revisit again and again. But I want to mention it now. Because if anything appears over here, it must appear over here. So if there's a desire to do good with food, then you can ruin your life with food as well. Right? It has to be that way. Otherwise, there's no free will in this world. Okay? Hold on to that thought. I want to move up, and then I'm going to change topics for seven minutes, and I'm going to reveal something to all of you which none of you have really heard before, but hopefully it will change the way you look at life as well. Okay? So every... Oh, one second. Physical desires come with an opposite. Right? Which looks real, smells real, but actually isn't real. What's that? Drugs. Drugs. What's drugs all about? Drugs, they give you a high? Yeah. They feel good? Absolutely. I mean, don't tell our kids, don't do don't drugs, they're terrible. We're like, they're great! But they're going to ruin your life. Yeah. You know, Nancy Reagan passed away recently, yeah? She was famous in the 1980s, if I remember correctly. The Just Say No campaign. Remember that Just Say No campaign? Just Say No to Drugs. This campaign they spent millions on millions on, and it failed miserably. Why? Because you would tell a kid, just say no to drugs. And the kid would say, why should I? Why? Give me a reason. Give me an alternative. They actually changed that campaign. And I remember, I remember having advertisements recently in the past 10 years. Instead of talking to the kids, just say no, now they talk to the parents. Talk to your kids about drugs. You hear this one? Sound familiar? Talk to your kids about drugs. Talk to the kids, there's nothing. You as a parent need to talk to your children, not say drugs. Talk about it, discuss it. Tell them how bad it is. So if you think about it, drugs are the perfect counterfeit. By the way, drugs doesn't mean narcotics and marijuana and cocaine. It also means too much eating, right? Too much sleeping around, right? Too much drinking. Too much of anything. Everything has to be within moderation. Too much anything. Because right? remember, it's the how, the why, the when, the where, and the when, and the, and the why. All those important questions. So we talk about physical pleasure, we want to say, like, figure it out. Because sometimes you're going to be in relationships that seem real, but they're not. Is it possible for a person to be in love with someone they don't even know? Yeah. Sure, yeah. absolutely. Right? Think about, right, the uh, infatuation, right, lust, whatever it is, right? Obsession. Obsession, right? A person is, right, you see those, these teen girls screaming the audience of that, right, that band, whoever it is. Up on the stage with the Beatles, One Direction, whoever's up there, right? <laughs> screaming, like, what are you crying? I don't even know who it is. What are you crying for, you Miss Sugar Nose? I like the music. Scream, ah! right? I'm in love. You're not in love. What are you talking about? You're 15 years old. That's what you are. You know? Okay. Are we together so far? Think how much time, effort, and money you spend on all of these things before you even start life? It's a good question. Okay. So we spoke about infatuation. We spoke about the opposite is always going to exist. We spoke about the idea of how we are pleasure seekers. Really, we are harmony seekers. Okay, let's go a little bit further. And it goes like this. If we jump up a level, and when I say a level, I mean far, we get to something else. And nothing that we all desire. What else do we desire? What other pleasure do most of us desire in life that we're always looking for? Turn on the radio, turn on the music, and they're all singing about love. love. Okay? Every musician, every movie, no matter what it's about, it's all about love. It doesn't always mean love to a, you know, a guy and a girl. It could be a parent and a child. It could be a love for a job, a position, whatever it is. But really, we all want love. Okay? And we want harmony in our love. And we want harmony in our physical, too. So love is greater than physical pleasure. How do I know that? I'm going to prove it to you. But before I do, let me ask you a question. What's love got to do with it? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds familiar. 
What's love got to do with it? What is love? Anybody here? Put your hands up if you've been in love before. You two are mad. Put your hands up, please. <laughs> One couple here. Put the hands up. You two. <laughs> yeah, think about it. You've been in love before. Anyone experienced love? Does that speak to me? You know, kind of got me any love. Yeah. I hope so. How do you know? That's a good question. But what is it? Someone says, "Are you in love?" Uh, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, your wife, your friend, your parent. Your... Do you love me? You'll be like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that is. What, what is that thing? What is that? To answer this question, I want to reveal something for you very, very different. But to do this, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to go to what you call an America left field. Which, for those of you not from this country, means we're going to go out there, then we're going to come back. So we're going to take a journey, we're going to go to, the, and then we're going to bring it back, Okay. And I want to talk to you about something completely different for a few minutes, and then we're going to come back to this discussion. Are you with me? Yes, Rabbi? Good. I want to talk to you about Hebrew. Hebrew. Hebrew is called, in Hebrew, Ivrit. Ivrit. But it's known as Lashon Kodesh. What's Lashon Kodesh? Holy. The holy tongue. It's holy. Oh, what's that about? Why do we call it holy? Right? They don't call French holy, right? they don't call Latin holy. Why do they call this language holy? What is it about this language? Let me reveal to you something very, very interesting about this language. We're going to go deep, so really focus very, very hard, if you will, because this information is going to last you the rest of your lives. And I wish I would have known this when I was in Yeshiva growing up. And it goes like this. Check this out. Hebrew is not like any other language. All other languages were created by man. Right? Societies come together. They have to learn to communicate. They have to use speech, right, in order to have conversations. Eventually things get written down, and communication begins. A very, very human and important trait. That is how languages begin. Judaism says something very different about Hebrew. We claim that Hebrew existed before the world existed. What does that mean? Well, let me explain to you like this. What's the first verse in the Bible? I'll take it in English. What's the first verse in the Bible? In English, in the beginning, God created heavens and earth. Now, let's say I was a Christian, which I'm not very clear about that. I am right? But let's say I was a Christian. What information has been given to me? There's a God. That's important. There was no heaven and earth. There was no world and planets and universe. And then I, God, created the heavens and planets of the universe. Ta-da! That's pretty good. So... The verse in the English is telling me who and what. It's not telling me when. It's not telling me why, but it's telling me who. That's pretty good, though. The Hebrew, however, is telling me something very, very different. The, listen very carefully, please. The Hebrew is telling me how God created heavens and earth. Now, you can read the English a million times. You can be the greatest Bible scholar. You're never going to see it in the English. It's only available in the Hebrew. There's an extra letter, a word, in the first verse in the Hebrew. Let's look at the words in the Hebrew. Barisha, bara, elokim, etashmai, etaharetz. In the beginning, God created heavens and earth. Okay, what's different? There's an extra word. There's an extra word that has a translation. That's thrown in. And it's actually pretty unnecessary for the meaning of the verse anyway. And that is, et, 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 et. Aleph. This word has no translation. What are these two letters? The first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Right, the first. And this is the last. Say the deeper Jewish thing is a beautiful <laughs> idea. You can read this verse completely differently. In the beginning, God created heavens and earth using the letters Aleph through Taf. From Aleph to Taf. How did God create the world? He used the Hebrew letters. They are the genetic code that made the entire universe. It's all there. Look at the letters, and you'll know how he did it. I'll tell you something interesting. I'll give you, I'll give you some examples, which you're going to like very much. Hebrew is the only language that I know of where the word for a word and the word for a thing are the same. What's that? A davar. A davar. That's the word. A davar. By daber. And the thing, an object, is a davar, davar. Why is that? Because the word 
is the thing. You see, other languages, first came the thing, and then came the word. Uh, this is a table. What came first? I'll take an answer to this. What came first? The first ever table, or the word table? What came first? The first ever table, or the word table? The first of a table. The first of a table. Right, someone put four posts together, put something on top, said let's call it a tableau, it's kind of a tableau, give a table. I don't know how we got there. <laughs> right? But it got there eventually. In Judaism we say no. It's not true. First came the word by Dabek. God spoke out creation by Yomer. Ten times it appears in creation. And from the word came the thing, because the word is the thing. That means if you want to know what anything is, any object, any idea. Look at the Hebrew word that God created the world with, and you'll see the devar concretized in the thing itself. Let's do some examples over here. It's been too esoteric, but you're going to like this. What's the Hebrew word for a dog? Kelev. Kelev, right. Kelev. Right, what's a kelev? A dog, actually it's two words. Kol, lev. What's kol lev? All heart. Man's best friend. That's the essence of what a dog is. Dogs have that essence. That's why we love the dogs, yeah? Pretty incredible, isn't it? I mean, all the other animals, they give us so much. Elephants, they move things. People ride on them. Right? The ox dragged the plows for hundreds and thousands of years. Right? The goat gives us its milk and the cow gives us its skin and its milk. And all of them are in the barn. And the dog. And what does the dog do? <laughs> yip, 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 yip. That's be like the dog lovers, right? People love their dogs more than they love their families, I know that. But we'll leave that aside, right? What does the dog do? He just barks. Okay, he rounds up sheep once in a while. But the dog is inside the house, at the table, being fed, sitting in the bed with us. He might go, boo, 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 I love you. Mm. What about the poor cow? He gave us the milk and the cheese and the leather, your clothing and your shoes. And he's outside, mm, in the freezing cold. And the dog, because there's a trait that a dog has that no other animal has. Loyalty. And we like that. And actually, in Jewish life, and the Jewish thought in Torah, there's certain things the dog gets that no one else gets. Certain leftover korban or sacrifice meat was thrown to the dog, Shukul Keller, thrown to the dogs. We like dogs. We appreciate that faculty that they have, that faculty of loyalty. So we welcome them into the home. How do I know this? It's not that the dog came in the Hebrew word. The dog is the word. The devar is the devar. The word is the thing. If you want to know, why dogs are so wonderful? God created them that way, and here is the evidence of left. What's the Hebrew word for um, scales? You know, like in the old delis and groceries have these scales? You want to know the Hebrew word for that? Moznayim. Moznayim is the Hebrew word. Moznayim. Huh? Moznayim. Mm -hmm. What's the root of the word Moznayim? Also Mishkan. What's the Hebrew word for a Moznayim? What does that mean, the root of it? Ozen. What's an Ozen? An ear. Why would the word for ear be the same as the word for scales? They're balanced out. You're balanced out, that's right. If your balance is out of your ears, Nahon, if you lost it, you're out of it, you can't get out of bed. Right? That's the root of your balance. If you're lying in bed, right, and you're balanced, you can't get up, you're like, ooh, everything's spinning around. Place your beds, place your beds. You know, it's like you're at the roulette wheel. Right? You lose it all. Because the word is revealed to me, that's the root of it, is balance. So balance, it's there. We Jews have known for a long time, the oza inside the ear is the center of balance. Right? That word's been around for thousands of years. I'm going to keep going, hold on one second, hold your breath and write it down, I'm going to come to it. I'm going to roll. Hebrew word for a, let's do some fun over there. Hebrew word for a face. Hebrew word for a face is a panim. Now this is very interesting. The word panim, right? The word panim, pei nun yud mem, actually spells another word if you change the vowels. Do you know what that word is? This is pa-nim. But I can change this to read per-nim. What's panim? Inside. Panim is inside. Why would the word for a face be the same as the word for inside? Well, how do you know how someone's doing? Their expression on their expression face. face. Exactly right. When I walked in, if I walked in the room, I was like, hey, everyone. I'm doing well. How do you know? Look at my face. You don't look at my hand or my knee or my foot. You look at the face. If I walked in, I was like, <laughs> you're having a bad day. Or sneezing. Right? Or I'm sneezing, thank you. Right? But my face is revealing my insides. This is very, very true. How about this? Have you ever met someone, right? 
Because your faith reflects your insides. You ever met someone and thought, wow, he is such a good looking guy. She is so beautiful, right? And just the most beautiful face. Everything's perfect, right? This guy's got the perfect long blonde hair. He's got the dimple in his chin. You can sharpen a pencil in, right? Everything is perfect. Eye cheekbones. Everything is absolutely, mwah. Yeah, love it. This girl, she's so good. Look at that girl. She's so beautiful. And then you get to know them a little bit. You get to know their penim, their character, what they're like inside. And they're not nice people. And what happens? They become ugly. Their face changes because their penim reflects on their face. Or the other way around. You meet a girl and she's like, oh my God, I cannot look at her. She's just so ugly. Oh my God. Look at that guy. Put a bag on his head. I can't. Oh my God. And then, and then you get to know them, you get to know their pinim, and they're really nice, good people. And they actually become good looking. Every time they fall, their face changes. My wife says, when she first met me, okay, never mind. Um, that's the way it works. It changes. Because the pinim is a reflection. By the way, who was the most good looking, one of the most good looking women in all of Jewish history? Sarah, Sarah and Esther. I tell them, right? Mm. Esther was beautiful. By the way, how old is Purim this week? Well, to mention Purim for a second, how old was Esther in the Purim story? 16. You thought 16, yeah? What else? 40. Some say she was maybe in her 20s, some say maybe 30s, 40s, most people say maybe 50s, even 60s. Yeah. Yeah. Changes the whole view. If they made a Purim movie, which I'm surprised they haven't already, it would be less Scarlett Johansson, more Meryl Streep. That's what I like to say. That's what I like to say, right? She was a very old woman, right? But she had tremendous beauty. It was an inner beauty that Achishverosh was totally attracted to. Abraham didn't even see Sarah's face, right? So they said she was always covered. However, however, her inner beauty was such that when he did see her face, it showed he's like, wow, this woman is unbelievable. Who was the most good-looking man? You can't just pick up women. Who was the most handsome man in Jewish history? Anybody know? Yitzhak. Yeah. Joseph. Joseph, yeah. They say Joseph, the Torah itself says he was so good looking. <coughs> Women used to jump onto the walls to catch a glimpse of his face. Yeah. Just to catch a glimpse of him. And that shows how difficult his task was. Because there he was, away from his family, living in Egypt, the vice with all the money, all the power. And he had to resist this and marry the right person. Now you know why he's called Yosef Atzatik, the righteous one. <laughs> Not easy. What does that mean? So are we Jews into good looking people? No. It shows their insides were such, they had so much chain, so much grace that it came out on their face. Okay. So Hebrew has revealed it to me. Okay, we're coming back to our story. Are you with me so far? Let's take all this information we looked at for the past seven, eight minutes, and let's bring it back to our discussion. What's the Hebrew word for love? The Hebrew word for love, as all of you know, is Ahava. Now, I may have mentioned it last week. Most people make the mistake of thinking Most people make the mistake of thinking yeah, that Ava is a cream that is sold in the malls <laughs> by Israelis who come here for three, four months and make a lot of money. That's true. But before it was a love cream, it, <laughs> it was an idea. Now, how am I going to know what love is? That was my first question. Remember that 10 minutes ago? Well, let's look at the Hebrew word. Maybe there's something in the Hebrew word that's going to reveal to me exactly what this thing is. What's the root of this word? Okay. The root is, no, that's to love. love. Ava is love, or it's to love. What's the root? Of the root? Every Hebrew word has a root, a two or three letter root, depends who you go like. Actually, the root is this, hav. What's hav? To give. What's her name? To give. It's Hebrew too, havli, give me. It's Hebrew. Hebrew. Give. What does that mean, give? What does love got to do with giving? Now, every yeshiva boy and seminary girl hears it, oh, I love this. This I love it. Every girl he learns yeshiva. If you have ava, if you love somebody, right, if you give them, they're going to give back to you, they're going to love you, right? But we know that's complete nonsense. It's one of the greatest lies of world history. <laughs> the entire advertising world is based upon this idea, but it's not true. If I give somebody something, Maybe they'll love me, maybe they won't. If I buy my wife, I don't know, um, half carat diamond earrings. <laughs> now for me, I'm like, great. By the way, I don't know what carrot, I thought carrot was a vegetable, then I got married. <laughs> so the word carrot became a whole different meaning to me, right? 
<laughs> so it's half carat. Now I buy these half carat diamond earrings. I'm like, these are for you, my love. She's like, what's this? Half carat? What do you think I am? I'm a two carat girl. She never says that. My wife would never expense anything. Half a carat? But, but I just gave you something. But didn't the rabbi just tell me if you give somebody something, they're going to love you? Isn't that what we just learned? Where's the love? <laughs> oh. How about kids? Right? Let's see you have a kid and you give them whatever they want. Whatever they want. You want to go to bed at three in the morning? Go ahead, Google You want the new iPhone? You can have it. You don't want to go to school today? If I, you don't want dinner? You want chocolate for dinner? Go right ahead. What a loving parent. What happens to that child? They end up in therapy with the rest of the Jewish people. <laughs> Two hundred dollars an hour on some couch in Manhattan. Why? Why? What? You making the money? Exactly. You're making the money out of these people. You love this. Why? Because the child becomes a spoiled little brat. Right? Now, listen, every child's got to take, right? And give and take is part of life, right? Someone's pointed out when children are born, which I've been present at five births, thank God, you come to this world with their hands closed. Right? We come to this world as takers, but we all leave with our hands open as givers, right? Can't be coincidence. So a child has to learn how to give, right? Strongly Jewish thought. We want to train our kids into giving Why? Because if you, listen very carefully, here's the punchline. If you give somebody something, maybe they'll love you and appreciate it. Maybe they won't. Maybe they expect two carrots, right? <laughs> maybe they'll be a small little kid. But one thing we do know, if you give somebody something, you love them. The love follows the giving. The love follows the giving. The way the giving goes, so comes the love. If you give somebody something, whether you like it or not, you're going to love them. And sometimes, you don't want to love them. But you can't help it because you've given them so much. You're in a dating relationship, you're in a family, you're in a business, you're at work, whatever it is, and you're forced to give. Be careful who you give to, because if you give somebody something, you're going to fall in love. That's why... This is actually the idea of a great Roy Dessler. He goes into this in great detail. There's a beautiful essay on this, which I recommend everyone reads. I'm going to bring you a copy of the link. He says, that's why a mother loves the child more than a child loves the mother. It has to be. Because the mother gives and gives and gives and gives. And what does a child do? Take and take and take and take. Three in the morning, when she's doing that, first of all, she had the baby for nine months holding this creature, you know? And all the pain that goes with it that is painful. Look at what shows in the movies. Uh, right? Oh, it's tough. I mean, I know because I wasn't pregnant. Right, but you know what it's about. And it's tough, and there's a lot of investment in the child that it goes on, right? And how long does that child depend on you? How long do you have to keep giving to that child? 20 years, or if you're Jewish, 35, 40 years, you know? <laughs> We're needy, even as adults, yeah? Constant give and give and give. But the more you give, the more you love. Now, in a relationship, by the way, it's a side point, which is a whole topic of in and of itself. But in a relationship, Sometimes you give and you don't get back and you end up hating the person. So some of you have a couple, ironically, that break up. That break up, or maybe there's a divorce, heaven forbid. And they always start with both sides giving. And then one side gives, one side takes. And that builds up resentment. And, then they, and who ends up most upset after the breakup? The one who gave the most. The take is not upset. They're able to move on. I had a couple that came to me a number of years ago. And they've been dating for three, four years, which is, as you know, in the world today, very common, right? No one gets married outside the religious world unless they're dating three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine years sometimes. This is very common. And they're banking on the fact they're going to end up in this relationship, end up marrying them. And they walked in, and she sits down, and she starts getting emotional. Before, you know, I said, you know, how can I help? You know, she's in the mascara, snot bubble, the whole thing, you know? I said, what's going on? She goes, Rabbi, I want to get married. I'm like, thanks for the offer. I'm already married. And I'm like, oh, you, him. And he's sitting there, you know, like drool over. You know? I said, what's the problem? She says, look, so we've been dating for three, four years. I want to stop talking about marriage within the year or so. And he's like, I just graduated law school. I've got another three, four years to like really build up my career. I said to her, on a scale of zero to ten, zero being the least, ten being the most, how upset would you be if you broke up right now? She got emotional and said, 10 out of 10. And I said to him, how upset would you be? He said, I don't know, 6, 7. Now, most people hear that story and they'll be like, what a terrible guy. Right, this poor girl. It's not true. He's being honest. 
When I hear that information, I just apply this formula. And what's this formula? It just shows that he was giving less than she was. She was the giver, he was the taker. That's really what it was. She gave more, she loved him more. He gave less, he loved her less. Didn't hate her, he still loved her, just not 10 out of 10. Six, seven out of 10, that's also love. It's just not enough to create a family. Or to want to create a family. So this is the secret of life. By the way, what's the counterfeit with this one? Everything comes with a counterfeit. Physical is drugs. What's the counterfeit of love? I think someone mentioned it before back then. Infatuation, Infatuation obsession. Right. Feels real, smells real, it's not real. All of you are enjoying this course, I hope. Do you know who's getting more out of this course? The people are running it. All right? People who run this organization, right? the other rageaholics. Right? They get more out of it because they've given time and effort and fundraising. Oh, God, fundraising. Right? It's a lot of effort. The more you give towards it, the more you get out of it. That's a secret to life. Now check this out. When we talk about different levels over here, we're not talking different levels, we're talking different stresses, <laughs> different worlds. We're not, okay, there's physical pleasure, and then there's love. No, 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 you're missing the whole point. There's something called physical pleasure, and then in another world, in another galaxy, something called love. I'd like to prove this to you. I need a female volunteer Laura. to be asked questions over there. You can't volunteer someone, they're going to volunteer yourself. Okay, we're going to go with you. You were too quiet over there, you gave it away. What's your name again? Irina. Irina. And what do you do for a living, Irina? I'm in graduate school. To be a? Child psychologist. Child psychologist. Perfect. Perfect. Great. Um, are you married? Would you like to be married one day, God willing? Yes. Fine. Imagine that Irina gets married to a wonderful, handsome Russian man. And uh, Irina, that's a blessing, by the way. And Irina uh, gets pregnant, God willing, with Shah Tova. Amen. And she has a baby girl. Be nice, right? A baby girl. And I'm going to give her a name. I don't know. Let's call her Sarah. And I decide to visit Irina after she gives birth to a baby girl. Right? So I come to the uh, front door, right? And she just gave birth a few days ago. And I'm like, you're like, hello! I'm like, is Rabbi Laura? And I'm like, oh, Rabbi! And you open the door, and there she is with this beautiful baby, actually, let's be honest, two, three days after birth, they're not beautiful. They're little squished creatures. They're grey, and they're, they're little, like E.T. They're a little flathead. Well, whatever, fine. But I said, oh, what a cute little baby. And we sit down, and we get talking. How are you feeling? How's your husband doing? Well, he's here. He's working. Great. I'm like, I really, I'd like to make you an offer. I'd like to buy your baby. <laughs> Russian Jewish girl, we're in for business. I'm gonna be fifty dollars for Sarah. Deal? Hmm, play hardball, okay. A thousand dollars. I'll take care of her. She's gonna have the best education, the best life. You're never gonna see her again. Thousand dollars. Ten thousand. Hundred thousand. Half a million. One million dollars to give me a. By the way, this is why I always go with a girl, not with a guy, because I reach a million with a guy, and they're like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> we can have more. So I learned from experience, always ask a girl this question, and not a guy. <laughs> of course you wouldn't. I read it, read it, a billion dollars. If I offered you a billion dollars, you wouldn't give up. You just met this baby. You just met her. And yet you're not willing to sell her for a billion dollars. It's crazy. You know what you're telling me? What you're saying is something amazing. First of all, you're a billionaire. That's what you're telling me, yeah. right? You're a billionaire, right? Because this child is worth a billion dollars to you, 10 billion dollars. But you're saying not so much more than that. You're telling me that you're not willing to give up one small moment of love for all of physical pleasure, because you can do a lot of physical pleasure with a billion dollars. Don't think about it, I'm gonna lose you. <laughs> but you get the idea. Nachon? You can buy everything. Every yard you can have, you have vacations, retire, and you're like, forget that. I've got this little creature that's going to drive me crazy and cost me <laughs> millions of dollars for the rest of my life. See, it's not different. It's different planets, different galaxies, different universes. That's where we go. But it's not enough. It's not enough because, and by the way, let's remember, we have, this is a leadership ambassador seminar, right? Let's try to put that in here as well. Becoming a leader is a thankless task. Running programming, 
right? Being a parent, trying to help your community, your synagogue, I don't care, your, whatever it is. Drive you crazy. Drive you crazy. Yeah, but why do I care that much? Why does it bother me? It doesn't bother them whatsoever. Because <coughs> you put your physical into it. You ran, you do things, you put things together, you bought files like Jassy did for us, you know, and made the chair together and got everything ready, put the food out there, and right, and then you put your love into it because I want you to enjoy the program, right? And I want you guys to. But that's not enough. That's not enough. Why? Because we know people who have lots of physical enjoyment and they have lots of love. And yet they're miserable. Think of all the celebrities, right, that we all sadly follow. Do they have lots of money? Tons of it. Do they have love? Gorgeous husbands, gorgeous wives, some of the beautiful children. And you're like, I don't understand it. Why are they so miserable? Why are they all so depressed? Right? Why are they all getting married? Right? They're getting always for some reason on the front cover. I don't get these magazines, but you see them in the checkout, right? The guy in the supermarket. There's always a picture of them one week they're together holding hand, walking on the beach, always walking on the beach, up and down the beach with their kids, up and down, up and down, up and down. And the next week, there's like a split in the page, <laughs> Splitsville. And you're like, what happened? Right? And they're trying to fight who's going to get the kids, and they're in the media, is like following them, taking photos of them. You saw it this week. Right? And then publicly, and oh, what a train wreck. How did this happen? It was all going so well. Right? Okay, then they end up getting divorced, and they all become capitalists. Right? That's the way it happens, right? They visit the Kabbalah Center and all stuff. But before they start doing that, right? But they're always, what happened over here? What are they missing? Seriously, they have the physical, huh? they have love, gorgeous spouses and children, right? Fans that adore them. Thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, or millions of followers on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all the rest of it. And yet they're all miserable. What's missing over here? So I want to share something else with you, which is crucial. In order to appreciate all of this. And what they're actually missing is... Anybody know? Meaning. Meaning. You've got to have meaning. There was a very interesting man called Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust survivor. He was a psychiatrist before the war. And after the war, he survived and wrote about, wrote a book. Actually, why it was very interesting. I read an essay about him, I believe it's true. And it said that he had many people come to visit him after the war as a psychiatrist. And they'd be like, I'm depressed. Uh, like, you know, everyone in New York, I'm depressed. And he'd be like, what are you depressed about? Family? No, I have family. Money? I'll make a living. Kids? Healthy? Right. What's wrong? I'm depressed. And he tried to figure out what was the problem over here. Why were all these people who had all these wonderful luxuries and had wonderful families all depressed? I mean, before the war, it wasn't like that. What was missing from these people? And he said, you know what? It's this. Meaning. They were missing, missing meaning in their lives. He, have, and he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning, which is a classic book, which I highly recommend. It's a very thin book, difficult to read, but a beautiful book. Meaning about those purpose, meaning purpose. purpose in life, yeah. Finding a purpose, finding a meaning for your existence. It's not enough that physical pleasure. Okay, there are some people who just push, push for that. And not just love's not going to do it either. People are just trying to find nothing. Love's going to solve my problems. Does marriage solve your problems, Mark? No. It doesn't. Esther, right? It doesn't solve problems. Sometimes it exasperates your problems, makes them worse. It doesn't do that. People think, but if I fall in love with a great guy, great girl, then I'm gonna have everything. No, you're not. Whatever you were before just becomes exaggerated. That's all that really happens once you get married. It's not really doing anything else. A few more minutes, we're gonna finish this up. So we are really looking for purpose in life, meaning. What am I doing here? What's my role in life? What's my mission? <clears throat> Everyone has a unique mission. Just like no two faces are the same, says the Gemara. So too, no two fingerprints are the same. So do no two missions are the same in life either. Everyone has a unique mission in this world. You've got to find it. It's a very important thing to do. That's really what we're trying to do in life. What's the counterfeit? That's not true. But in meaning, what is it? False meaning. Is there false meaning? 
Yeah, of course there is. Lots of people who have false meaning. All the isms. Every Jew creates every ism, you know what I'm saying? Communism, socialism. They're still talking about it. Right? Every ism. Right? This will solve the world. This will solve the world. We as a people constantly try to fix the world. We're trying to, we Jews are famous for this. We give charity way more than anybody else. And we're always trying to fix the world, improve the world. It comes from a good source. We get it wrong, though. There is false meaning. I know we live in a world you can't say that anymore, right? Everything's good. Whatever you want to do, express yourself. That's not true. Abraham spent his entire life walking around Iraq, or Kastim Haram, saying, Don't kill your kids for God. We spoke about this last week, remember? Don't kill your kids. Whatever you do, that's not the way we serve God. That's false meaning. And we're still telling people to blow themselves up. Just yesterday, a guy goes into a Turkish marketplace and blows them up and kills Jews and Israelis and U U in, uh, US citizens and non-Muslims. Right? He's getting meaning out of that. But it's false. It's wrong. That's incorrect. You can say it. Don't worry. It's <coughs> false meaning. It's distorted. You have to go back and find your true meaning. That's not so easy. Few more minutes, we're going to finish up, and we have our next session. What's greater than that? And by the way, you know the meaning is much better than love. People need to give up their lives for true meaning, right? Join the army, protect their country for good meaning. The same child that I really would never sell for a billion dollars, she'll accept if she lived in Israel to join the Israeli army, knowing for what? Heaven forbid, a child like that could. Why? Because meaning. Is greater than love. If you find meaning in something, you're willing to give your life up, right? You're willing to give up your love for that thing, that person, that object, whatever it is. It's got to be the right meaning. What's greater than that? Pleasure. All of these are pleasurable. Physical pleasure, love is a pleasure, meaning is a pleasure, much higher level of pleasure. Yeah. Oneness. Oneness is good. We're going to get there. There's something right before this thing. Peace, shalom, is good. Inner peace. All these things eventually are going to give you inner peace as well, hopefully. Fulfillment. Fulfillment. All these things fulfill you. That's also true. They will fulfill you. Right? Some will get fulfillment out of a drink. It's a low form. It's fulfillment. Yeah, yeah. They will get fulfillment out of love. Right? Meaning, the higher you get, the more fulfillment. They're all going to give us this. Also, quite a deep group tonight. Yeah, yeah, it's also true. Acceptance is good as well. To get your drinks. Mm -hmm. Dream about something and achieve it, actually. It's also true. You're thinking, I'll give you that. We review what we said. Sure. We start at the lowest level. We said physical pleasure was a level of pleasure. We said, you know what's greater than that? We have a thing called love. Love is greater, much superior. We said meaning, also we want to find meaning as well. All of this is true. All of it is true. So what's... I think, yeah, I'm asking what is mean greater than meaning. Yeah? Self-fulfillment, self-actualization. Yes. 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 But how? Through creating meaning for others. You see, meaning is about me. But there's something greater than meaning about myself, and that is to create it for other people. Create a movement, an idea that you can share with others. So you get a lot out of studying, and you get meaning out of your studies, but now what are you going to do in order to share that with other people? Apply it. Abraham didn't spend his entire life just studying, sitting by himself and meditating his whole life away. He went out to bring in guests. He wanted to change the world. He preached. He was aware of his surroundings. So we don't find personal meaning and say, oh, I've, I'm done. I can now just sit back and do nothing. How am I going to give that to others as well? Share it. Sharing is going to do it. That's what's going to Sharing, sharing information. Okay, the 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 soldier finds meaning. <coughs> the general who creates the battle plan gets more out of it. The builder builds the building, but the architect who thought it up, they put it all together. They create it. All right? They get so much more out of it. The creation of it. So we have to jump a little bit. But what's the top level? He's actually all four pulled together, and that's connecting with God, with the divine. That's what the Ramchal says. 
You get to a point where you connect with the ultimate creator of all physicality, of all love, of all meaning, of all sharing, of all giving. That, which could be a moment, is going to be the greatest experience a person can have. So you mean love, meaning, and sharing the highest. And oneness, connected to the ultimate one, being the ultimate creator of everything, is the highest level. That's the fifth level. That's first class. That's traveling first class. That's what I'm saying. Harmony of Every one of them brings you harmony. And they all harmonize together. As a side point, in a few weeks, two or three, we're going to discuss Shabbat. Shabbat actually is the living example of all these five coming together. Put that in your cerebellum. We're going to revisit that. Shabbat is going to be the coming together of all those together, every single one of them, into one day which ultimately is a representation of the next world. We shall be doing that. Okay. We have completed our one hour. Over one hour. We're going to take a break, a five-minute break. Actually, we'll make it longer. We get seven minutes. Seven minutes at quarter two. Come back here. We're going to start our second session, which is going to be the learning one-on-ones. Good stuff. Thank you. You are British, right? I am British. Yeah.